Hello, everybody, and welcome to this DevOps conference. My name is Leandro Melendez, and I come today to give you an awesome presentation about performance testing and observability, how this is a match made in heaven. Now, to not to waste too much time, let's get into the presentation. But before that, uh, for the ones that do not know me, who am I? My name is Leandro Melendez. I am also known in the internet as Señor Performo. I am a developer advocate at Grafana Labs, where I keep talking a lot about observability, uh, Kubernetes, and cloud, and all these type of curious things, right? And as well, as I mentioned, I am also known as Señor Performo in the internet. I have a blog that I should pay more attention to, but, well, uh, lots of interesting performance-related articles in that blog. I recommend you to take a look. As well, I am a podcaster. I am the host of the Perfites podcasts in English and in Espanol. Uh, last but not least, well, almost last, I am a YouTuber. I have a couple of YouTube channels as Señor Performo as well. If you want to follow up on any of those, uh, feel free to like, subscribe, activate the bell, and all those youtube things. I am also a conference presenter, as you can see here, uh, virtual conferences, in-person conferences, many, many adventures that you will be able to find me at as Señor Performo. And now for real, last but not least, I am the author of a book, a performance testing book, uh, called The Hitchhiking Guide to Load Testing Projects, where you will learn how to drive through a traditional performance and load testing project, specifically load testing with lots of examples. But if you want to follow up a little bit more uh, about me, you can follow up on the QR code that you are seeing on screen right now, and you will be able to like, subscribe, do all the follow-ups, and get the book. Anything that you may need, feel free to look it at those uh, links. Now, enough about me. Let's uh, get into our talk today, because as I mentioned, we're gonna put together this match made in heaven that we are going to be putting together two subjects. The performance, uh, modern performance, we will get into that, why I mean uh, modern performance. We will put together the performance object and the observability subject. They will get together and find love between them. But because among themselves, they make a lovely couple, one of the best couples that you will find out there. But Let's start talking about subject one, performance. This, oh wow, this misunderstood person that goes around the world being understood by other names and not truly um, understood by what uh, it really is. So let's uh, dive into what is performance testing. Well, step number one, first things first, let's get ourselves acquainted with our subject. Performance testing, as I mentioned, is usually misunderstood. Uh, when people hear the term performance testing, generally they think about load testing, which is not right. Performance testing, if you get anything from this talk, the biggest one that I would like you to get is that performance testing is not an equal term, is not the same as load testing. They are not interchangeable, they are not the same thing, to make this a little bit clear, it would be like saying that Microsoft Office is the same as Microsoft Word. Can you tell there are big differences among them? It's the same as you were saying, performance testing is the same as load testing. Load testing is a sub-practice of the performance testing trade. There are many different steps and activities that you can and should be doing around performance testing and not only or mainly load testing. So please, please, please beware. This term that brings rain and sadness into our subject, subject uh, make sure that if you get anything today is that you understand that performance testing is not the same as load testing and that it's not the only thing that you should be doing performance-wise in your system. Got it? Okay. After that, let's move to the next one. We are going to be talking today about continuous performance, which is one of the subfields of performance testing that I was mentioning. 
Uh, let's think of our example earlier, load testing is Word. Well, continuous performance could be like Microsoft Excel. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, performance testing doesn't need only or mostly load testing. This is something that is especially true nowadays when we have modern DevOps projects that are in the cloud, that are continuously being released, that are often being pushed into production because you truly do DevOps and are agile if you, at the very least, once a month, push your solution into production. You do releases. You put it into operations uh, very often. And since we are not doing this, um, we are doing this uh, frequently, we already have a productive system. And if we are doing Agile the right way, we are not pushing huge releases into our software. So the key of the modern performance is to not to focus only on load testing. Load testing is still important, and I'm not saying you should never ever do it again. But most of the time, and especially in your DevOps cycles, in your continuous Agile, CICD cycles, where you are constantly pushing uh, new uh, code solutions, requirements into production, you don't need to do these massive load tests that try to bring down the system to test the capacity every sprint. No. As you can see here, the only one that deserves this type of things is our friend Taylor Swift. <laughs> well, no, she's not the only one, but events like Taylor Swift. What I mean, if you have, let's say, Black Friday, if you have a Super Bowl, if you have, I don't know, tax season, end of year uh, submissions, Christmas, Mother's Day, all these type of events that, yeah, of course, are going to put your system up to a test, are going to be pushing it to the limits. But that doesn't happen on every sprint, right? So you shouldn't be trying to do this type of uh, load tests every sprint. You should be doing continuous performance, which is fairly different to just doing load testing, okay? Please, also, make sure that this is clear. The Taylor Swift type events, yes, they are very important, and yes, you should be prepared for them. But that's not the only thing that matters in performance testing. Our users may need to use the system only one user at a time. And if the system is slow for only one user, well, we have a problem. If in your continuous release, one thing gets slower, non-related to load, non-related to multiple users, just gets slower. This happens. Sometimes there's a mistake on the developer. We place a file elsewhere. We misconfigure a DNS. Things that can affect those are continuous performance things that do not have to do with load. Taylor Swift and those events, yes, lots of load. But if you're not having that on every sprint, which I pretty much guarantee, if you get Taylor Swift on every sprint, let me know because that's a, you're running a huge, damn good business. <laughs> but no, things that are going to put your system to the limit. So we're going to focus today on modern performance that checks continuously the performance of your system. Okay? Now, we're going to focus as well, like following up this um, motto of uh, making a match and getting these two technologies in love. In these uh, modern dating applications, you can do this swipe left and swipe right, right? Well, in IT, it's called shift left and shift right. So I'm going to pull here a little analogy of what are the advantages that you can get with performance if you're swiping left or swiping right. I mean, in other words, shifting left and shifting right. If you swipe left, focusing performance in continuous cycles, continuous performance testing that is being executed and probably automated by the developers, you will get lots of benefits. This as well could be matched up with not needing to, uh, well, not allowing your developers, your team, every, everybody in, the, uh, in your uh, group to check in code that doesn't come with an automation, with some performance metrics, with some elements that are important for us to have at hand when we are running this type of um, projects. Uh, as well, as I mentioned, if you're shifting left your modern performance practices, 
you don't need this BALT, which translates to big ass performance tests or low tests, uh, equivalent to the ones that we mentioned, like Taylor Swift events and similar things like Super Bowl, Black Friday, and so on. You don't need these swiping left your performance test efforts. You need to set your performance tests automated to be set as part of the continuous executions. You manage this by doing your performance automations very similar to how you do them. You do your code releases, your code work. If you are following the Agile principles, you will be uh, releasing little bits and chunks of codes, requirements, solutions, and so on, which nowadays uh, our load testing, no, our performance testing, see, I am the, I also make that mistake here and there. Our performance testing automations should focus as well on these little tiny pieces, only on API calls and being modular. An advantage is that if you have all these modular things swiped to the left, you will be able to generate uh, lots of kind of Lego blocks that you can put together eventually if you need to test for a Taylor Swift event. So these are some of the benefits that you will get with continuous performance uh, in, if you swipe left. But if you follow the principles that I am describing and that I am going to show you in a moment, you also get some, well, many benefits if you swipe right, if you shift right. What does this mean? Once you get into production, some of the things that you created following up the principles of modern performance and continuous performance, these tiny little animations, tiny little blocks that are not load tests, they are not massive. Um, you will be able to inherit your automations, your tiny Lego blocks and pieces to ops, to production, to support the SREs. Everybody that is checking production will be able to use those in a manner known as synthetics. They will be able to be running them always, all the time. Well, it depends on your taste, right? You can run it every five minutes, every 10, every hour, or even every minute. Or some organizations, is, uh, they are executed even like several times per minute. So depending on your taste, you will be able to uh, put them on production and leave them running. Uh, the benefit that you will get is that even if your users are not active in your system, you will know what is the health of the system. What does this mean? Well, how many of you, when you find a problem, go and report that problem on your system, create a bug defect or something, and especially in public systems when you are not liable for it? Well, what most of us do is just shake our fist and close the tab. That's not what we are looking for here. We want to know exactly when something is happening, even if the users are not clicking anymore. This is an advantage that you are going to get if you inherit this modern performance. Now, some of these advantages that I mentioned as well, not only in shift left, shift right, also in the middle. As things are flowing towards production from the left into the right, you will be getting multiple benefits as these automations can be executed. Tiny, tiny automations, just a few virtual users checking if you have, let's say, a development uh, environment, if you have QA environment, staging environment, pre pro environment, and even into production. Each of these steps, you can be executing those uh, automations continuously, frequently, and they will be, give you some visibility of any change that you get in the future. This will help us also to filter if you can move something based on old metrics. What, what do I mean? Like uh, an old process was checking, checking, checking continuously, and the new change is coming towards production. But from these past events, you know that it should not keep moving if, it, if the performance is not great. Another big benefit is that if something makes, to, makes it to production and you have these continuous checks and something doesn't work very well, in production, from them, you can trigger automatic rollbacks. You can get lots of benefits from this. So let's do a quick demo. Here you're seeing a repository where I have some example files that we are going to be using today. Now, these files, I already have loaded them in my uh, Visual Studio code. The main one that you will see is that we are running a simple service, which is something that I created just 
because we don't want to mess up with real performance. So we can here define it. Our service is going to respond always in between half a second or 500 milliseconds and two seconds, 2,000 milliseconds. It's going to be uh, listening permanently to the port 1234, and from it, uh, we will be able to just call it, and we will get a response. And the response delay or the time it takes, the performance for this, is going to be in between half and two seconds. So check it out. Let's call it quickly. It's localhost, 1234, and let's send it a variable it receives. It can receive variables. So this service is going to receive uh, the variable that we're sending and tell us how long did it take. Simple, nice and easy. The service, in order to start it, you can go to the terminal, go and, and um, invoke it as node, simple service, .js. You can find it in the folder that I showed you earlier. Now, as well, in Visual Studio Code, I have some simple scripts. Let's focus on K6. Here, you have a really, really simple script that uh, calls localhost 1234, and that will be waiting or sleeping uh, for four seconds. And that's it. It's got just going to be calling it. Let's give it a try quickly. In our, here I have the K6 script. So you type K6 run simple script. And if we execute it, it's going to go call that service and bring back the result. That's it. Uh, as we can tell here, the response time, let me make this a little bit bigger so that we can see the K6 results a bit prettier. The um, duration, 1.41 seconds. It's very much in line to what we were looking for, right? Now, let me quickly get some other commands I have here in the repo that we can use for our K6 execution, because I want to increase the duration for this. Let's add the, this little element so that we are going to get the duration to be not 30 seconds. I want to make it a little bit longer, but just to have a template. So instead of 30 seconds, I'm going to do it 3,000 seconds, which is almost an hour. Not that I'm going to leave it running for an hour, but uh, it's part of the, import, the important elements that we are going to be looking into. There's another element. I have a uh, InfluxDB database that will receive all these metrics continuously so that we can observe these results from elsewhere. So let's run this again. I forgot to put it earlier. Quick, 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 quick. This is, we don't have that much time. So again, instead of 30 seconds, I'm going to put... 3,000, and let's go to the end and run the script that we were running earlier. Zero 02, simple script. This is going to generate, as you can see here in the back, Influx is receiving information from our uh, script. Keys here. The script is very, very small. Let's go back to the script. It's just calling it. Most of the API services, API animations, should be this small, and then you can put many together if you need something larger. But in essence, this is what should be running continuously or in your pipeline so that you can check what is the health of the system. Now, if we go to Grafana, which is a very convenient position where we can visualize this situation, um, admin, because this is just for testing, I don't care. I'm not going to change anything. I have a dashboard created here that will show us these K6 results. Let's zoom in so that we can see the response time that we have been experiencing. Now, you're, you may be thinking like, okay, this is nice and all, but uh, where is the super cool thing? And this is uh, refreshing every five seconds. This is executing, let's think in your, I don't know, dev environment, QA stage, whichever environment, it is good to have this running on every environment. Now, as you saw, I have here the code for the simple service that is waiting in between five and two seconds. But what happens if, as a developer, I release something that makes it go instead of five, 
to in between five and 10 seconds, the performance is gonna be uglier, right? So let's stop the service, restart the service, and automatically, if we are looking at our Grafana dashboard and our automation that is running continuously, we will be able to observe that suddenly things are way, way slower. Can you see this jump? This jump can trigger alerts, can trigger rollbacks, can stop a release. So this difference will be the way in which you continuously can stop and make a gateway for this uh, situation. Now, let's move to another, uh, let's keep going with the uh, presentation. Okay, so you saw a demo, very, very quick demo, of how modern continuous performance can work. It's not low testing and we catched a problem. Now, let's talk about subject number two, observability. The object number two is also kind of misunderstood because the description always uh, of this subject, well, when people think about observability, it's like this thing that measures hardware that only SREs and operations people should be paying attention to. But you're wrong. There's much more to observability. A dictionary def definition of observability is the capacity to infer the, system, the uh, status of a system from data available externally. What does this mean? You can know what is the temperature of the, I don't know, the engine of your car without lifting the hood, just with the information that is being displayed on the dashboard. That's super easy. You don't have to put your finger inside of the gasoline tank to know if you still have gasoline. So, observability, to obtain this observability, this capacity to know if you still have gas on the tank, is achieved through four steps. First, you need telemetry, which is the transmission of the information of the state of the system that we are checking. In this example, maybe the temperature of the engine or how much gas do you have? Something that transmits how much gas do you have on your system, in your car. This is achieved through instrumentation. The act of instrumenting is kind of in inserting or installing a device that will allow you to get telemetry, a device that will measure and transmit. In the car, usually as an example for the temperature of the engine, you have a thermometer with a wire that transmits everything. In the gas tank, you also have like a floating bomb that will tell you how full or how empty it is, and it will transmit the status. There are several systems in the car that are instrumented. Even modern cars have uh, the tires instrumented with a little sensor that wirelessly detects the pressure of the tires and send it to the car's computer. Now, if the metrics that are, you are interested on about your system have some relevance in the future or you will need for analysis or predictions, you will need storage. The recommendation nowadays for this type of information is to use a time-based database, such as Prometheus, Influx, Mimir, and many, many more that are out there in, in the industry. Now, with this storage or the telemetry, the information that you get transmitted, well, usually those are only numbers, metrics, things, logs, statuses, we will talk a little bit into that which are not generally understandable by, by humans. So what do we do? Well, we create monitors, pretty dashboards, pretty panels, things that will be shiny, pies, graphs, things that we will be able to understand, not just numbers, but a measurement of how full or empty is our gas tank, the temperature of the car to paint a flame if it's hot or things like that. So to make, it th make things easier. Now, I mentioned earlier that observability has uh, different measurements and things that we'll produce. It produces three feelings, I like to say, like following this uh, love and dating apps, making a match uh, motto. They are called the pillars of observability. Traditionally, they are known as the three pillars of observability. First, you have logs. They are kind of text descriptions of the events that happen. It's just, think of it, and it comes from uh, ships and boats from the past, pirates and carri carriers that, oh yeah, at 10 p.m., 
two sacks of beans uh, got loaded. At 5 p.m., we hit an iceberg. At 11 p.m., I don't know, one of the sailors uh, jumped. So you don't have exactly the same things for everything, but everything is locked with text. Has some advantages and disadvantages. Now, the metrics are just numbers. You can create a full database, full just of numbers that you can pair up with some tags or labels to know what is about each one of them. But in general, it's just numbers or it could be true, false, like some statuses and some information about what are them. The deal with metrics is that they by themselves don't tell like a full story. Sometimes like the logs can, but what happens if you put them together, logs and metrics, and tie them up through a span of events? You get traces. With traces, you can dig up into what is happening on each one of these um, spans that you're interested. What happens when I click this? Okay, it went to the database, it took this long there, then it went to the web server, it took this long, then the CDN took this long. You will get an information graph telling you where each step was wasted or taking time. And the last, I, th I said three, but here you can see four. There's some new proposals to call profiles, uh, the fourth pillar. Since they are still kind of debated, I'm not gonna dive too much into them because I want to get to interesting points about this. Observability gives you also some capabilities to swipe left or swipe right. Into the swipe left, when you have observability, when you have your software, your automations, your systems, infrastructure, hardware, everything instrumented and generates telemetry, you will get information from every system and environment involved in the creation of software, even the developer's machines. If your software is well instrumented, when the developer is typing or hitting debug or uh, compile and is debugging the software, you will be already generating some performance metrics, some logs, some information which is really, really good because it will automatically, from inside the software, similar to the cars, when you buy a car, internally it already has devices that generate information so that you know what is the health of the car. In the same way, your software with observability will be reporting the health of the system as it progresses through your CICD, your environments, uh, from dev to QA to staging to pre-prod, what was the performance as it was moving through each one of the steps? And with this, you will also get some comparisons from uh, productive or pre-productive environments. Similar as I was mentioning earlier, as your software moves towards to production, you will have metrics from the past that you can compare to and say like, whoa, 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 wait there, or come on, please come by. As well, uh, with this, you will be able to generate reports from any events or any actions that you're taking in your system. Think of functional tests, integration tests, user acceptance testing. As I mentioned, uh, developers doing actions in the system, debugging, everything that happens, you will already get performance metrics. And this is not only on the left. Once you get to the right, if your software has instrumentation, telemetry, and everything in place, you will get also information you will know about the actions that are taken in production. As well, you will receive all those metrics from events that happen in production. Users logging in, users clicking, and this can go all over the place. This also can trigger rollbacks. As I mentioned earlier, when you get to production, you can stop all the things. And there's much more. You can get business intelligence, you can get metrics and utilization, and many, many more things. Now, let's do a quick demo and see how we can enable some observability into our systems. As I showed you earlier, uh, we opened the simple service as we had it uh, just a simple service that was just doing simple stuff. But now I have in this folder, in the manual folder, a, some function that I created called instrument. What instrument is just doing is sending to Influx manually this information uh, that is going to be captured from our service. This is super straightforward. We'll receive some information that will be tagged as duration and stored in Influx uh, DB. All this is being uh, achieved by this super, super simple and straightforward function. Now, I created a new version of simple service where I am imp importing this uh, sent data to Influx and 
We also have the, star, the maximum and minimum uh, response times that we saw earlier. But the cool thing that I am doing here is creating here where we have the random delay. I'm creating a start time. Then I am creating a duration, like start timer and timer. I will start a timer, uh, subtract the timer for the second uh, moment, and from there calculate the duration. After that, this is going to be sent automatically, send data to Influx as duration. And with this, we have instrumented our software, our service, which will be automatically reporting to Influx. So now let's see that in action. Let's go back here. I already set everything ready to start a simple service manual. Let's start it. It's again listening in port 1234. And when we call it, let's call it the same again. Not much difference. And it loads again. Big difference, data sent successfully. Our service is telling us that it's working, that the telemetry is working and the data was sent. Influx here as well received another one. Let's refresh and see that it is working. As you can see here behind, we generated another one with a new measurement. Now, if we go to our Grafana dashboard that we were checking earlier, well, not the same dashboard, I have another one where we can see the observability on Influx and go now to the last five minutes. Here we see the two measurements that we just executed. Let's set some auto refresh here, auto, that is every five seconds, it will be automatically refreshing and I will refresh my service. It generated another record. Let's generate another one. See, now this was two and a half seconds. One more. And we have now almost five seconds. Now let's go back to our dashboard. We see exactly those measurements reported by our software. We didn't need an automation. Manual actions happening, done by me, were automatically sent. Let's do another one so that you can see what is happening. This one was super quick and it also appeared super quick in our Grafana dashboard. So with this, very simple, very straightforward steps, I automated our service. There are multiple ways to automate it. This was manual. You can create it with uh, client libraries, agents, and a multitude of things that will give you observability. So this was awesome, right? Our software, if I am running functional tests, if a user is running our service, if anything is happening, we already get the information. Incredible, right? Now. Let's keep moving because you already saw some of the benefits of, of, of observability. If this service ends up in production or when this service is also in the developer's machine or anywhere in our uh, solution or our framework, we will get metrics from it. We will know the performance. And right now I just showed you the response time. There are many more things that we can get from it. So let's go back to our presentation. So as you can tell, it's a match. Putting those, these two things together will bring so many benefits that we will see in a moment. We can pair up this modern continuous performance with this modern observability and create a match and make all these two persons that we were talking about earlier to talk to each other. So let's see how will they work together because there are multiple benefits that, we'll, they, that we will get. If we do the swipe left, swipe right, all the different actions that we saw earlier with both individuals and we make them hold hands with each other, oh my God, you will see all the awesome things that we will get. When we swipe left, if we have continuous performance running and at the same time observability, we will be able to do several comparisons from actions from the users. We will get metrics at every moment, even when Developers are executing manually when they are clicking, when there are automations, testing automations happening, when there are other tests, other things, integrations, when by accident someone just executes the software that we are running it, and the performance automations, we will get all that information. And what is best? All these metrics that you saw that were being generated either by the continuous performance or by the observability are programmatic. You can pull them by a pipeline and 
make all sorts of decisions based on these metrics that you will see. There's so much more that you can do. But as well, when you sw swipe right, you will get, you can leave these automations running in production and continuously get information from synthetics. And again, not only from the automation, but from the backend, your software will be reporting those metrics as well. You can also deduct what is the performance that the users are experiencing. We will get a little bit more on that. But when a real user clicks on your software, you will know what is their experience, what is the performance. If there are any errors, either generated by a real deal user or an automation or one of the synthetics that we, are, we live running, you will get the benefits also of some reporting. As well, as soon as the system goes down, your continuous, uh, uh, um, your continuous synthetics will be reporting the status, as well as if the user receives a weird <laughs> situation. With all this in place, you will also enable some chaos testing. So beware, there are multiple benefits for this. And even some wild environments where you may say, I don't want to do this type of test. I just want to implement release techniques to easily uh, roll back my changes or compare or see what is the system. If you have green, blue, you will know A-B testing, canary, all this. You will know what is the experience of your users and you can let them do the tests. That's awesome, right? Now, as you can tell, synthetics and observability is better if you do it both ways, not only swiping left, but also swiping right, which what I mean is having it on all the environments. If you leave the synthetics running in the devs machines or in the dev environment, uh, QA environment, uh, staging, pre-prod, whatever you call them, and even in production, you will have metrics as your software moves to production. The synthetics will give you a heartbeat and the software, as it moves, will get a comparison to that hardware. In that grade, you will be able to take all sorts of decisions based on that. And also, that's not it. There's not only swipe left and right like in the dating applications. You will get the benefits or, of swipe up and swipe down. What do I mean with this? Well, swipe up meaning going front end. The benefits of swiping down means going back end. In the back end, what I mean is more hardware, infrastructure, servers, the OS, getting the metrics that are important. If you implement observability in your hardware, which you can, you can also instrument your CPUs, your hardware, your hard drives, your network, you will get all sorts of information from these devices. With this, whatever happens from the bottom level of your solution, will be automatically reported by this uh, observability, by the instrumentation and the telemetry. But as well, in the middle, if you are instrumented, this is pretty much what I showed you, in the services, in the program level, when you are running unit tests, but not only that, you can also instrument your databases, your servers, web servers, I mean, applications, all sorts of things that you need to be paying attention to, and much more. There are many, many examples that probably I cannot come up with at this, at this moment. But as well, there are benefits on the top. Observability, instrumentation, and telemetry can also be implemented in the front end, being the web application or the desktop application or the mobile application that your users are uh, working on. Here, I'm showing you a little bit using Faro, the web SDK, a solution from Grafana that you can use to gather these performance metrics from the browser, the end user experience. Then you can log it and then you can watch it uh, with Grafana and know what your real users are experiencing. But not only that, we also have K6 browser. So if you pair it up with real browsers running every few seconds, you don't need a multitude of users just opening up a browser, clicking on main critical elements of your solution and gathering those results continuously, you will also get uh, end user experience, continuous experience, know about um, outages and problems, and as well, you will know what is happening with your real users. The capabilities here are endless. So as I was telling you, there are many, many more benefits that you can get pairing up these two. Swiping up, swiping down, swiping left, swiping right at the middle. It's all full and full of love and good relationship between these two. 
<clears throat> some of the benefits, recapping a little bit. Q&A and performance will get you so many benefits from observability as information from some other tests, as functional, integration, unit, many, many things that you will get. And on the observability, SRE side and so on, you will get lots of information from manual activity, like user acceptance testing, exploratory testing, activities in production, or release techniques, AB, Blue Green, Canary, and all of this. Why are there tacos in the middle? Well, I like tacos. Why not? It's a very good intersection for everything, right? <laughs> so I'm sorry. I, I just had to add it. I found it funny. So let's do a really, really quick, quick demo to not to extend too much on this so that you can see how both are working. Now, we had our data sent successfully running, was uh, calling the service. Things were being logged in InfluxDB. And now what happens if we run our K6 script. So once our K6 script is hitting the system, you can see here down that the data is being sent successfully, and you can see here that InfluxDB is getting information. Let's go to our Grafana dashboard and see how things are looking if we refresh and see there are a lot of um, actions taking place from our scripts. But this is a mix. If I went manually and did executions, we would get information about this. So here we have it automatically coming from our um, system from within. It's reporting from inside. And as well, if we go to the other dashboard, we can see the results that we are getting from, let's go to the last five minutes again, our automation with K6. So we're getting both. We can put together these two dashboards and match up and make sure that we get all the information all the time. But isn't this great? We are also triggering all this continuously and getting live heartbeats of our application. So this was the presentation. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I really hope that you are really excited and that you can't wait to see what happens when you do this lovely match between these two technologies, modern and continuous performance and having observability on your solutions. As you could tell, the uh, possibilities are endless. And with this, I close it up. Here's the YouTube channel. If you want to follow up with me, like, subscribe, and all the things so that you can learn a little bit more about performance testing, a little bit more about observability, IT in general, QA in general, and to make sure that these two, when you implement them, live forever, happily ever after. <laughs> That's it for me. I am Leandro Melendez. Thank you very much for enjoying, well, joining this presentation. I, sh I really hope that you enjoyed it. Keep enjoying this conference, and I'll see you around. Adios.